Okay. Okay, fantastic. All right, here we are. We are reviewing a game. Uh, there's a channel point incentive on my channel, if you don't know. Um, just like five grand or something. Uh, and you get to submit a game for review. So we have a game here. We haven't done one of these in a long time, so this is kind of long overdue. But this was submitted by Sonoy. This is a turn zero game. Uh, and Sonoy was the black player, I believe. So we're going to flip the perspective just to make this, um, you know, a little bit more um, digestible from Sonoy's perspective. His opponent was crazy with the white pieces. Uh, and it's turn zero, as you can see. So let, let's just jump into it. Let's see what we got going on. Turn zero, of course, we haven't played in a little while uh, because season three of the 5D Chess League was Defended Pawn. <laughs> so it's been a while. I mean, when this was submitted, turn zero was the flavor of the month. Uh, and people still, I think, for the most part, prefer turn zero as their premier sort of standard option. Let's just see what happens. Okay, so uh, we're going to start with a cool knight of three here. Knight f3, no exp no explanation necessary, uh, super safe, it prevents from travels along this file onto the f2 pawn, uh, it's like the best move in 5d chess, the game was from like two weeks ago, never mind, I've been, uh, I, I've, I've been switcherooed, so while, while the game review was redeemed like six months ago, uh, the PGN that, that Sonoy sent me is from like two weeks ago, so, um, okay, Right, so, knight f6, this, this, is, this is just how you play turn zero. If, if you're not crazy, this is how you play, or I guess if you are crazy, since that's our opponent here, this is how you play turn zero. Not very much to comment on here. We have, uh, very quickly, on, on white's second move here, a4. Okay, so, spicy already. a4. You might ask, why a4? Well, okay, so it's turn zero, so one can't ignore the possibility of uh, of a turn one F7 sec or a turn zero F2 sec, right? So really, your job out of the opening is just, for the most part, to prevent your opponent's queen from traveling to, uh, if you're the white player, this square, uh, and if you're the black player, this square, right? So does A4 accomplish this? And the answer is actually yes. So like if... Uh, what you need to do if you wanted to make the sack happen the next turn as the black player is push c6 uh, and then the next turn get the queen out to b6 and then you'd be just in time on the on turn four, I guess, uh, to get to turn zero f2, right? So uh, why does a4 actually help? Well, in response to c6 to prepare to bring the queen out, all you do is push a5, which doesn't look great. <laughs> and isn't great from like a tempo perspective uh this pawn is all but useless there isn't like center control your pieces aren't developed you're pushing a pawn twice before you have any developed pieces and it's on the edge of the board uh but uh you know a5 here on the next turn does prevent the queen from going to b6 to make the sack happen so it's it's okay, right? It's not like you immediately get F7 sacked on. And, you know, when you're playing 5D chess, especially a variant like turn zero, uh, you, you want to sort of mix things up, right? You, want, you don't want the opening to get too stale. As it is occasionally want to do, at least if you're impatient. So, A4 been played. Uh, that, that's the idea. Uh, in response, what do we get? We get D5. Okay, so... Or the sort of like usual uh, knight of three, knight of six opening is followed by a like, most frequently d4, d5, and then c3, c6. So that prevents all travels to the f7 and f2 pawns, and uh, it just you know like develops your center in a way that you can you can get your pieces out. So it's no big deal. So essentially, what Sonoy's done as black here is ignore a4, which I think makes a decent amount of sense and just develop his pawns in a way that prevents his opponent from um from from making the travel happen uh and you know you're just, you're gonna get your pawns up you got center control you're gonna get your pieces out it makes a lot of sense so nothing too crazy here okay <laughs> next move white plays h4 okay <laughs> so we have we have like a a crab opening, but there's a knight out here, um, which is really something. <laughs> okay, 
what is the i mean all right so it's cute right like a a4 h4 is cute it's not like it automatically loses in any way it does beg the question of what <laughs> like now if if black were to put the bishop on g4 there's no pawn to kick the bishop with which is kind of annoying um it kind of like commits your pawn and doesn't develop any of the other pieces in a way that's pretty unnecessary it does take away this square uh like pushing this pawn uh toward the king side is something that you often see a few turns later into the game uh, and its function is sort of to prevent like if you wanted to get a queen to f2 in this situation as black then what you might sort of want to do uh, eventually is push this pawn up get this knight out in some direction and then put a queen on h4 right so <laughs> A preemptive h4 prevents a lot of queen shenanigans uh, where the queen gets out to h4 here and then and then attacks the which this knight was doing already by the way but uh, you know you, you don't want like the knight can get traded off it can get kicked off whatever um, for example the bishop here and then the sack into the knight you don't want black I guess to be able to just get to h4 and then sack on to f2 or something but it's that this is ill-advised it's not it's not immediately losing, um, but <laughs> it doesn't do a lot for you. I don't think I need to explain this. This isn't good in regular chess either, right? Um, but it is meme. And um, if you're winning in fun, uh, then then you're you're winning the game straight up. That's that's how it works. So, <laughs> what are you doing now? What's the response? Okay. So if you open up the deep on, uh, then you have to close in order to prevent like a quadragonal or a triagonal i guess in this case mate onto the king from the opponent's queen then you have to close the propagation of this triagonal by pushing this pawn not that black is in any danger of that happening anyway because like <laughs> a4 is already occupied by the opponent's pawn and so he'd have to like push this and then push this and then get the queen out there probably isn't gonna happen but i mean structurally this is what you want to do anyway so your king is safe. You're not going to get traveled onto. Uh, so now you can you can develop your pieces and, and move forward like that, right? Um, okay. Let's see. Uh, where are you going next? <laughs> okay, c6. And then in response, a5. Now, this might be, I think, a miscalculation from crazy. Because <laughs> at this stage... The queen here next turn would not be able to get to turn zero. It would only be able to sack on turn one here where the knight's already developed on F2. Uh, and like a queen here, oops, a queen here on this board, it's not lethal. Uh, you, you don't have the lethal tactic of the, like, the traditional F7 sack or F2 sack, what have you. Uh, let me just make sure that that's right. So here we've got B6, um, like if this pawn hadn't been pushed. Um, c5 d4 e3 f2 yeah of course okay so unnecessary a5 was unnecessary um <laughs> again it's okay <laughs> three wing pawn pushes uh after the best move in 5d chess i mean you're still probably fine as white this was totally unnecessary it doesn't really accomplish anything um besides me i mean yeah it's there isn't really any point to it's like, there, there's not really any point to doing this. Um, if your opponent wanted to push here, probably like kicking kicking the queen off of b6, where it doesn't have fantastic options for where to go, um, is probably like better to do after the queen's already out here before you're committing. Uh, it's not great. This is one person playing calm developing moves and the other believes they are a crab. Uh, if we get h h5 next, <laughs> I'm going to lose my shit. Okay, so... <laughs> A5 has been played. Fantastic. What do you do? Okay, what do you do now? What do you do now as black? Uh, you keep developing your pieces. The point was playing Hyper Crab. <laughs> Does this have a name? <laughs> also, why is it the Hyper Crab if they're in a... I mean, it's like the knight is played, right? So what is this? Is it like a crab with uh, like a tumorous growth uh, coming out of its face? A crab with like an extra, like an extra stubbly arm between on its like bicep? What's going on? What's the theme? It doesn't... <laughs> there's no... Okay, apparently this is the hyper crab. Uh, 
5D Hyper Crab requires one Knight F3. Why is it called a Hyper Crab? Usually Hyper is a term used in chess openings to denote uh, like a distillation of an opening into uh, basically you don't play like preparatory moves. You just like go in, right? <laughs> crab is A4, H4. Okay, so Crab is H5, A5, H5. Okay, except there's the Knight of 3 first. Whatever. All right, fine. You know, you can call it whatever you want. <laughs> it doesn't make it any better of an opening. But what do you do as black here? Whatever the fuck you want. Who cares? Uh, you probably, um, like I said before, doing this is nice. Because this knight is the... Yeah, I mean, like, this knight is important, right? It's, it's literally white's only developed piece. Uh, and in general, it's like the primary protector of the uh, F2 square. So... <laughs> And it can't get kicked because your opponent's already committed h4. Uh, hello, where can I play this game if I don't have Steam? Uh, welcome, Nightfire Hose. If you don't have Steam, uh, you can play this game um, at, I think, chessin5d.net. Uh, it's a website created by, um, it's developed by uh, one of our near and dear community members, Alex Bay. He's basically, he's recreated the client uh on this website where you can play in browser it's kind of a work in progress uh he'd already made the website and then he's overhauling it with like new and improved sort of features uh so you, you can play it there if you like all right okay so well, what does it actually do um calm developing move i assume okay bishop g4 makes sense um why wouldn't you do this uh th this knight is pivotal there's no way that you can deal with it. He doesn't have any other pieces. Uh, that's it. What does hyper accelerated mean? <laughs> Kappa? Well, you're mixing up with accelerated? Um, yes, but hyper accelerated is like most of the time, hyper is put in front of accelerated in terms of chess openings. Um, that's just how it'd be. I mean, listen, we're not gonna get into chess opening etymology right now. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna see what white does here. Okay, we've been we've been looking at black's perspective and thinking, okay, what do we do? Um, let's take a second and consider white's options here. <laughs> what do you do as white? Um, pushing e3 is never a bad idea. Uh, that allows you to recapture um, with the queen, uh, whereas otherwise you're going to be recapturing. With the g-pawn in general um this like making this trade here for let's just say some like nothing move has been played uh this trade here is in regular chess you might take this any day of the week thinking i've disrupted my opponent's um structure but in 5d chess it's actually not the end of the world for the white player here if they have to capture with the g-pawn because Rooks are, especially on the king side, kind of, uh, they, they do a lot of work in terms of cracking open uh, the opponent's position. Uh, rooks are so difficult to activate just because pawn structures are generally kind of really rigid in 5D chess. There can't be too many holes. Otherwise, there are like opportunities for, um, you know, travels like into your territory. Uh, and so opening up this G file for the rook to stare down isn't, is, is kind of nice. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of difficult for your opponent to get to the F-pawn anyway, uh, especially if, well, okay, you kind of can't <laughs> castle queenside here, but uh, usually if, like, this is open up, then in 5D chess, you try to sort of prepare, like, a safe queenside castle um, and pu push push your pawns up with the open, the semi-open file um, uh, like that. The issue here is that if the h pawn is already on h4 and this pawn is on g3 like this or sorry f3 um it, it looks just a little bit more sketch it like you're kind of overextended um it's not fantastic because i mean it's in general it's easier to like probe any given position uh in 5d chess than it is in regular chess 
it would just make me uncomfortable to have both have to have no pieces developed, open up my king side pawn structure like this, and also uh, not have as secure an option on the queen side in terms of you know sort of like opening up your king side and then castling queen side. So uh, you probably want to do something about that. Uh, one thing that you can do about that is to play e3. Uh, that opens up your bishop maybe to get activated somehow someday um and you can recapture with the queen uh otherwise i don't i don't know man whatever whatever you want maybe maybe, maybe you don't care so much about that but you want to activate some other pieces so maybe you can push your d pawn get your own bishop active start <laughs> sort of ignore the fact that you've played like a lunatic so far and actually you know get your get your pieces out there let's see what happens uh if hyper goes in front of accelerate to explain hyper modern i think it's kind of the same idea um well man maybe that's a story for another time uh hyper is just this crab's occupation it hypes <laughs> I, okay, no, you know what? I'll, I'll take that. Uh, it, it certainly does hype. Um, I mean, I'm pogged up. If, if this crab weren't played, we wouldn't be reviewing this game right now. So, The crab is the hyper uh, by, by occupation here. Narik says, I like rook a4 here. Uh, let's see what happens in the game. Okay. <laughs> on, on turn five, rook a4 is played. Okay, it attacks the bishop. Um, it <laughs> I mean, these positions are usually pretty closed and clunky. So like having a rook out there is <laughs> seldom super worth. Um, You, you don't I, I I can't really take this seriously I mean hard to develop rooks usually yeah but you don't want to just develop the you know it's like <laughs> as any chess player like as soon as they start you know sort of learning the rules to the game they'll be like oh okay rooks rooks I think are stronger pieces than the other pieces so let's go ahead and develop them you know right out of the gate with this kind of with this kind of sh movement but I mean, okay, irredeemable is a strong word. Rooks usually do nothing in 5D. I think that's because most of the games you tend to play, Narik, just don't go into endgames. Um, so I disagree. But certainly rooks get stronger the more open the position is in like regular chess as well as 5D chess. And the position's not going to open up very quickly in 5D chess because the pawn structures are so rigid because you have to play sort of in like a reserved way to defend your to defend your king, right? So doesn't seem fantastic. You don't really have to do much of anything, man. Your opponent doesn't have any pieces. You don't you don't even have to really respond to this. You can maybe if you really not to mention <laughs> this rook literally was doing a single job, which was defending this pawn. So what's wrong? Developing it, maybe exchange at some point. What's wrong is it took like three moves to get this rook into the game. Uh, it doesn't do very much. Uh, and you don't have any other pieces developed. So it's not like you can afford to give up the tempo or space, right? Let, let's see how it plays out. Let's just see how it plays out. Okay. Uh, Sonoy here develops uh, his queenside knight. We have knight bd7, which I think is sensible. Um, if white opts to trade here, then you take back, and then you've got a knight to, to replace the one that you put up there. Alternatively, um, you can, like, pull the knight back here. You don't have to wear, like, all these pawns are... <laughs> the, the queen can't move right now, so it's not like you can't afford to open up... Uh, like a single diagonal to um to f7 so i think it's sensible developing your pieces uh well then that's pawn moves that's the problem not the rook move yeah it's not it's not a, a 
your devil's advocate here doesn't really it i think it doesn't accomplish very much um like are you okay are, are you arguing genuinely that having pushed this pawn the rook development is suddenly more advantageous than like developing your other pieces because i still think i still think it doesn't make much sense <laughs> uh especially because it undevelops this pawn sorry it undefends this pawn rook a4 is stonkfish recommended that i believe i didn't know that david was giving out access to stonkfish but there we go okay all right <laughs> listen what do, what does white do now do, do you actually take this okay give it okay real realistically speaking Given that you've made this move, uh, like if I had to pick up this game from this turn for white, what would I do here? I don't know, probably still push this on to defend the knight. Like, given that you've already made these moves, is it worth, is it worth to, to trade the rook for the bishop? Maybe. How does it look after this happens? It's not like you've moved any, your, your g-pawn is still defended. I mean, it's, the problem with this is you've pushed h4 in addition to pushing a a5 and getting your rook out there so you can't kick this knight right it's not <laughs> i pr i don't know i probably wouldn't well maybe i would i i think i would probably push e i think i would probably push e3 preparing to take on the next turn not taking the bishop isn't good keep the tension it could be good in a second but not before like you can sort of maybe take advantage of like the one turn um like the one turn window that you have from like if this pawn is pushed then there's a turn where uh after you take the knight takes you the opponent doesn't have a knight here on f6 uh and if your queen has like a way to get to h5 on that turn or the turn after that then that's like maybe useful we'll see okay what does white do here <laughs> all right okay what does white do here let's keep moving e3 okay well sensible all right there we go <laughs> makes sense defends the knight uh i mean the bishop doesn't have really very many places to go, but <laughs> what's, I mean, in a situation like this, e3 is always important. Uh, pushing the e-pawn um, enables you to get your queen to the opponent's king side, uh, which is sort of paramount for threatening a lot of things in 5d chess. That's just the way that it'd be. Uh, I, I think it makes sense. I think it makes sense. Okay. <laughs> what next? What do you do as black here? Mm. You could now, well, let me think. I think maybe pushing your own epon isn't the isn't the worst idea in the world. It enables you to get your dark square bishop into the game. It opens up when you make like the trades happen or whatever. Um, like if this happens and you recapture here, having this queen here is actually kind of a big deal. Um, like the the availability of your queen to move to the king side, I think, is a big deal. Probably I'd just play e6 here. Other candidate moves. I don't know. You might okay. Well, when you see a rook on <laughs> when you see a rook on a4 like this, it might be tempting to play b5. Um, but usually this kind of, this kind of move, like the aggressive grabbing space, kicking things with your pawns is something that you have to kind of think twice about a lot of the time in 5D chess. Um, just because 
you you have to be acutely aware of the fact that weaknesses in your pawn structure are much more susceptible in 5d chess uh than they are in regular chess so when i see the when i see the b7 pawn gone i think okay the c6 pawn is now weakened it has no defenders and at some point you know when this knight does whatever it is that it wants to do and gets out of here um that's going to be an undefended pawn two squares away from a king uh and tactics can ensue so you have to be really careful about that uh so i think this is probably irresponsible um it's tempting but the rook's not doing very much there anyway so you don't have to like ruin your own structure um you know in, a, in an attempt to undermine your opponent's bad developed piece um could push the knight i suppose if you really wanted to um that seems all right too. kick the rook that way i probably i'd prefer that um then may maybe your knight can hang out here and then if he wants to push it then he's got to weaken his structure i don't know let's see what he does okay what does sonoy do <laughs> sonoy plays b5 okay kicks the rook um, it's not fantastic. I, we sort of just went over why I don't like this move. <laughs> we won't dwell on it. We won't dwell on it for too long. Natty sack us, why? Probably. I think now that E3 is pushed, uh, I like sacking here much better than I did before. It's probably what you do. Right? There's also some really spooky stuff now for white where I don't know if somehow there's like the like a bishop sack into here is evocative um, once this knight is gone or something like that uh, you know this is a perilous situation here for black's queen side well, what do you what do you what do you do what do you do as white I mean you're probably on passant here Ampassant is forced uh, in regular chess. In 5D chess, it's a little more subtle because it comes up so infrequently. Um, you probably Ampassant here. Right? I don't know. It also looks bad for white to enable the queen to hop to B6 like this, right? It doesn't look great. alternatives make this trade now which isn't like the worst well, alternatively i mean you, you could capture with the pawn which i like less i think the queen activity is more valuable there especially because this 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 pawn on e3 here is a lot weaker than it seems with respect to you know you can usually kind of like i don't know push this pawn like takes takes sack a queen into it and then some you know like night travel or something i don't know okay what happens <laughs> well believe it or not we're kind of like halfway through the game okay um passant does happen all right i think you take with the queen here i think the queen activity is more valuable than whatever you're trying to do with the rook there i think i think this probably is a no-brainer um and you haven't pushed your e-pawn either, so you're not, like, super excited to get your queen developed on that side of the board. Yeah. I think this a-pawn does a lot of work in, like, controlling sort of area against the opponent's queen in general, in a way that's, like, it's got, like, an understated role in that way. So it's kind of not obvious. Like, the queen can't do that much from here right now but i think this queen is probably a nuisance on b6 it's got a, it's got a lot of mobility okay what's going on now c4 c4 were played c4 was played okay <laughs> okay okay c4 was played Okay. All right. What? A, f a few things. Okay. 
So, <laughs> one of the, I mean, not that, <laughs> White clearly doesn't have very much regard here for, like, the development of his minor pieces. Um, but minor pieces are important in 5D chess. Um, bishops, b bishops do a lot of work in general. E3 has been played, and so that kind of makes you wonder... You, you gotta look at the dark square bishop and wonder like how exactly it's gonna get developed um right now it's kind of like tasked with the important role of defending the b2 pawn uh but if you were to kind of frappuccino idea um the bishop on b2 here actually does a lot of work looking at the knight on f6 welcome back Lois. uh so it's like not terrible <laughs> um alternatively if you wanted to develop it in the other direction uh once you've opened up d2 here you kind of have to rely on your c pawn to close up the triagonal especially in a position where your opponent has a queen on the queen side of the board without like an a pawn that you can sort of prevent it from coming to the a file with so the c pawn crucially <laughs> makes both of those things impossible. It makes impossible the pushing of the D-pawn and also impossible the frappuccinoing. Because uh, if you push this pawn, then it's undefended and you can't bring the bishop out before you push the pawn. So that's not amazing. Hey, an A-geek, how's it going? We're just reviewing some viewer games. Um, it blocks the knight, which the now that you no longer have an A-pawn, kind of the only thing that this knight was doing was putting pressure on the bishop on g4, uh, which is, you know, any piece in your camp uh, that your opponent owns is pretty scary in 5D chess, especially. <laughs> um, what, but what does it do? Let's, let's forget, let's forget what this move fails to do. Um, is it me or I feel like the volume of the stream is lower than usual? Uh, could you, if I said knight, I meant rook. <laughs> I do that all the time. Uh, yo, could I, could I, could I get confirmation? Our level's low. Should I be louder right now? Uh, just, just let me know. Might be on your end. It's unclear. Tested audio before the stream. Should be fine. But if, if there's a problem, someone please confirm. Uh, the, this rook. Okay. So. So what does it do? By the way, I like how surprise streams kind of have a schedule. <laughs> yeah. You know, we don't have a lot of time, so. It's got to be structured even when it's unstructured. Ob obviously, it attacks this pawn. It doesn't enable anything to become developed, right? So it's got to be like attacking something or grabbing space. That's got to be like the intention of the move. It attacks. It certainly does attack the pawn on d5. That pawn is defended. Um, but, you know, like I was saying before, uh, the fact that there isn't, like, the b pawn backing up the c pawn is actually kind of spooky. So, like, if... Um, if you were to... If white was to capture here, capturing here wouldn't actually be, like, the most exciting thing in the world. Um... The the one thing I will say about this move is it kind of baits your opponent capturing with the d-pawn. And if you as white can get a bishop on the di your light square bishop on the diagonal to f7, then that actually makes for some spooky times. So uh, like if here white were to capture here... Uh, and you got your bishop out, then like a bishop queen battery, which you can't do again because <laughs> your the, your opponent's got control of the file here. Uh, could be scary. Um, so like that's a reason that you'll sometimes see in in structures where e three has been played in lieu of d four. Sometimes you'll see c four get played. Okay, let's see how black deals with it. Uh, let's see how black deals with it. If our, can I can I get confirmation that levels are normal from from anyone who isn't Los? <laughs> now now you got me now you got me worried. Okay. Now what do you do? As black. 
I think you can kind of largely ignore this. I I might I th maybe you push this pawn uh, to get your to get your bishop into the game. Um, maybe you um, maybe kick the rook with your knight. Maybe you probably don't want to sack this now. Because that could get a little bit scary with this queen and this bishop eyeing up. I don't love that. You can maybe even like Frappuccino this bishop in Castle Kingside. Uh, levels are leveled. I feel like it's normal. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. Bunch of preach. Okay, what does black do? What do we do here? Travel. Travel on to F2. Um, wow. He goes for it. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Um, this isn't the last turn he can do it. Um, yeah, he could have traveled next turn if he really wanted to. Could have maybe like, well, you probably don't want to push this in first because traveling after you've enabled the queen to come out to f3 is more spooky. Plus the bishop, you, I mean, you... Your bishop is doing so much work here anyway. Like, th this knight is absolutely paralyzed. There's nothing that this knight can really do. Uh, and you can set up for some pretty monstrous... Um, I don't know. Le like, this th this knight out here actually is, like, a cool move, tactically speaking. Um, so obviously, this can't happen because then the king captures here. Uh, or, sorry, the this can't happen because then the bishop captures the queen... And it checks the king one turn in the past. The king has to take. And then you have, like, mate here. Well, not immediately, but, you know, whatever. One one, one turn after that or whatever. Um, so I kind of like this knight move. Uh, th this, this knight is super paralyzed. So in general, you don't want to be trading this in. Uh, even in some lines, sacking the king on d4. Excuse me? <laughs> The queen? Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, I like sacking the queen better than, than sacking the king in general. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of, like, black is set up very nicely tactically here. In the present, uh, no, no travel necessary, but travel happens. What are our prospects? Is he going for what I think he's going for? Unclear. This has happened. Okay, so when this happens, unless you counter travel, which actually, I don't think that... Yeah, white white doesn't have any travels because the rook hasn't moved recently enough. There are no open lines for the... Actually, no, the bishop doesn't yet have... In, like, two turns, maybe the bishop will have a travel for white. Um, but right now, white's only legal move is to capture here. Because this queen is checking the king on the other timelines, right? Or uh, on the other timeline. Okay. Question is, what do you do here now? Uh, I mean, this, this, this is the only move. There's, there's nothing else that you can do. There isn't, like, the guaranteed... The, the squares from which you can checkmate this king with the queen are all either inaccessible or covered right now. Uh, so, like, ordinarily, you'd try to get your queen out to h4, uh, which is kind of like what I mentioned earlier. Um, you can get your queen to b6, also impossible. There's already a knight here, so you can't checkmate along this diagonal, like with the bishop, just by pushing this pawn up a few turns in the future. This, the fact that this pawn isn't pushed doesn't make that much of a difference, because there's a, there's, there's the h4 pawn out here anyway so like your queen couldn't go out there uh but also this knight is on f3 already so what are you what are you going for what are you going for is black here there is the opportunity okay you can exile which is ridiculous <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous um queen b6 looks spooky you, you guys are only... It doesn't look spooky at all. It looks spooky if you think your opponent is playing for a draw, right? So, like, queen b6 here is... You know, it checks the king, and probably what you want to do is recapture here. Um, moving king immediately does stop exile. 
Uh, but you don't want to play for exile. Bruh, D6. Excuse me. Oh, okay. Sorry, I, I was looking at Losis' comment of Queen B6. Yeah, so if you if you wanted to if you wanted to oh, soft mate your opponent and not mind the fact that you have all but given up winning chances in the game, uh, then what you can do is here, um, you can check the king here, and the idea is that um, you kind of force your opponent to capture here, and then with this knight, you can travel to f4 on this board, and it'll check the opponent's king in the past on this timeline from your new timeline. You don't have timeline priority, so that timeline is inactive. So, you know, what you do then a lot of the time is you just exile your kings, you create a bunch of inactive timelines where, um, oh, as, as the black player, uh, you don't have any kings on active timelines, so it forces your opponent to either play to a draw or try and get super creative, um, which is oftentimes, like, impossible for them to do. But queen d6 was, was proffered. And it makes a lot more sense because now um, queen b6 in this position threatens like an eventual mate, right? Uh, in that this triagonal to this king, the queen now has access to. Um, however, it's not fantastic <clears throat> since your opponent's already pushed h4 and knight f3. You can just play e3 in that position. Uh, like here if you play e3 then there's no triagonal that propagates from the opponent's king so i don't really have to worry about it um e3 hangs mate in two let's see e3 hangs mate in two okay e3 Hangs mate in two? It hangs mate in two. E3. Where can you mate the knight from? Or the king from you can get a knight here, but that's preventable. Um, with like g3, maybe something like that. Um, I mean, those are the only two pieces you have, so it's got to be like the queen and the knight, right? So, oh, I see, I see the mate in two. Um, with the with the queen on d6, if you push e3 immediately, then your opponent can check like that, and you have to move the king away, and then queen g3. Is hold on, okay. So this happens. So then um, e3. Ninety four So actually that's not mate because your opponent can I think travel this knight back two turns and then capture with the knight I think or something like that. Uh look away from my spoiler if you want to figure it out. I'm not too fussed. What is it? Uh, queen g3 check. You could also queen g3 immediately and then king has to take and then bishop g4. Hey, that's much better. And I like NA geeks much better. So if this happens and then this happens. Wait, you could just do that now. Huh? Oh, sorry. Um, we're talking about after queen d6 happens. So if this happens, then queen check. Only legal move is takes. Unless you, because we're, we're drifting into the territory where you can like travel enough turns back to, oh, the queen can only go one turn in the past because this hasn't opened up yet, right? So really, you can only go two turns into the past. 
So I think the mate in three isn't mate, but I think the mate in two is mate. Yeah, so e3, queen g3 check, king only move takes, and then bishop out here is mate. That was what I saw? Okay, Nurik and A-Geek get, get bonus points for seeing the for seeing the mate in two. Okay. In that case, maybe queen d6 does look dangerous. <laughs> Right? You, you don't have to push this this turn. Um, crucially. So. You can, like, push this, which is covered by the queen, the next turn, for example. Um, so. I don't know. Feels like it should be fine for a white. I guess you move the I guess you move the king back immediately, but that's still that's still mate. <clears throat> so I actually can't move the king back immediately. The fact that this pawn is on h4 is actually like really losing <laughs> deeply. Um You gotta get. You gotta prevent the queen from getting to here. The only way it can really do that is knight h is rook h three. Then bishop takes. Then takes here. This pawn's no longer defended. All right, so maybe it's scary. <laughs> maybe it's scary. I think white has to play king g one d four. King g1 is probably is probably the right move. You don't want to go king d1 because it propagates that because then there will be like a king here that you can mate in uh, diagonally with a queen on g3, right? So king g1 here is probably the move. I don't think that rook h3 actually works because you can just sack the bishop into it, um, or something like that. So. You do king g1, but again, it's not a huge issue because uh, the queen defends the pawn on d4 here. So yeah, I think queen, I think king g1 d4 is probably the is probably the play. Doesn't that lose to knight e4? Um, if king g1, then knight, then white plays knight e4. Uh, king g1 knight e4. Does black win the next turn? Because if so, I guess it's I guess it's just Monka S all the way down. Um, if if the king's on G one, then uh, obviously what Knight E four does is threaten Knight G three mate. So you can only really prevent that with this Rook. Uh, Tsume bro, <laughs> thanks so much for the follow. Much appreciated. Hope you're enjoying the content. Um, welcome welcome to the stream. Welcome welcome welcome. Uh, and if at any point you're forced to play rook h4, then the opponent can just grab it with the bishop. So maybe it is all just losing. Although, how many turns from now is that? Just one? King g1, knight e4. Wow, I guess, I guess that's that. How has this happened? I guess that's what happens when you don't have any pawns or pieces developed, right? What about queen g1, queen e1? Or sorry, king king g1, king e, uh, queen e1. So the only other way that you can... So if king g1 uh, and then knight e4, the only other way that you can defend um, g3 from the knight hopping in here mating immediately then with the rook is, as David's pointed out, with the queen. But then I think 
the next turn. Queen c5 is mate for black? Or do you have another turn? So that's a black knight. No, then that turn is actually mate. Wow. I should just lose. <laughs> okay. I had no faith in this travel, but I suppose a position where your opponent has absolutely no pieces developed is not to be underestimated. Uh, that's big yikes. Wow. Hey, poison. Weekday cement. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we can provide. Wow. Okay. You know what? It's not like this is like a massively applicable... <laughs> Um, takeaway for a lot of probably most of your 5D chess games. However, okay, a pair, all, all you have to really have <laughs> is like a knight and a central pawn pushed. <laughs> and if you can get an F sack off when your opponent doesn't have anything else on the board. Um, it's lethal. Like, I, to this day, I can't believe we're still, by we, I mean myself, uh, are underestimating, like, the potency of these queen travels. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, usually it's fine. Like, if, like, if you hadn't pushed this pawn, it would be fine, right? Okay, I don't think that there's too much of, like, a grand sort of takeaway that, that you can get from this. Um, so it's not even, yo, I discovered Vampire Survivor's Dopamine Simulator. I, <laughs> I just purchased that game and have played in the last few days like seven hours of it uh, just before bedtime, which isn't fantastic, but that game is pure dopamine. It's a good time. There isn't a lot of content, but okay. So what we have to ask ourselves is what was actually played by black in this position? <laughs> Did Sinoy actually play queen d6? Um, but good good eye um, on Narik though. Queen d6, absolutely devastating here. That's wild. Wow, okay. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, knight g4 check was played instead. Okay. This line is the reason that I was questioning the efficacy of this line of play. Although, okay, so here, the thing is you set yourself up to check your opponent again with knight e3. Uh, which checks the king on the this timeline here. So actually, well, okay, the issue is that it takes like two moves to get your queen along this diagonal. Uh, and the turn before you want to get your queen here, your opponent can push d4. So actually kind of any like mate you're going for along these lines isn't going to be super effective. Like if, if for example, the, okay, so let's see what happens next. So this checks, this checks the king. Um, knight g4 checks the king. King moves back to e1, uh, you know, which is sensible. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's central. It's it looks maybe slightly less spooky than keeping it along this open diagonal or whatever, right? Um, now, what do you do? Now, queen d6 be played. Well, okay. So now you're still threatening the queen g3 mate, right? Which your opponent has to cover. Like, white is objectively safer here um, than they were before. Is this enough? <sighs> so this right now is mate, right? Actually, not immediately. No, like the next turn, this is going to be mate. So, I mean, th this obviously doesn't do it, but now you actually have like no way of getting there. <laughs> but you, okay, so now at least, okay, so the rook is blocked off from the bishop. So this this move kind of works. Um, except now black can give a check here to the king on this timeline. Uh, oh, but it doesn't mate the opponent before this knight actually covers... Maybe that square or something like that. Or, you know, you can do like a travel with the n knight somehow. Maybe travel with like this knight and then like it recaptures on one of these squares or something like that. 
it looks sketch. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's still pretty rough. Um, it's 2D, mate. This, this is 2D, mate. Um, I mean, not with the work pushed up. But. Queen D6. Queen D6 is played. What do, what do you do now as white? Is there any way? Probably have to travel. Question is what the best way of doing that is. This knight doesn't really cover the squares that it needs to cover. Hmm. Doesn't look fantastic. Wish we could have looked at knight f2 instead of queen d6. Knight f2 here? With what idea? Because the knight on f2 here doesn't hit the king here. And also can be captured. It enables your opponent to fix his pawn structure. Help. <laughs> hey, crazy. How's it going? <laughs> I guess white is super wrecked here. What if you had played? I think it's probably, okay. King G1 here, I think maybe is safe. Because you earlier, like the, if you do the immediate queen D6 and the opponent has to move his king. The knight E4 sort of makes it possible to do stuff. Did you do my game first? No. Um, now if you're doing it instead of queen d6, pawns are too slow. It's a free queen, I think. Um, here if king... If instead of king e1, king g1, I think maybe it's robust against this queen move, possibly, because then you can push this pawn. Am I wrong about that? with this knight out here question mark all right well let's see what happens in the game <laughs> i okay there are a lot of crushing ideas for black here realistically uh you know <laughs> over time black is probably going to be overwhelming here queen to six basically threatens two soft mates so that's probably better i mean certainly i think queen d6 is better than knight g4 first that's for sure okay so we get c3. That's interesting. c3? c3, huh? c3? Am I reading this right? Yeah, c3. Okay. Queen g3 happens. Because it's... Because it mates the king two turns in the past on this timeline. So, sensible move, right? What's this game? Uh, it's a game between you and Sonoy. That was played nine days ago. Uh, so, pass check means you gotta travel, right? How's it going, Dom? What's up? So, you can't set up a recapture um, by doing this. It's like the furthest back that you can travel. Any of us at the night, I mean, unfortunate for like other reasons, but uh, this knight here can capture this queen. The only issue is that it is like immediately susceptible to getting recaptured. Um, so actually the travel that's done is the B knight goes to A1. That's what we see in the game. <laughs> Desperation travel. Okay. Um, so on this board, you probably want to capture as black the only piece that threatens the piece that you are mating with. So is that what's done? Yes, that's what's done. Then we get another travel. Uh, it's the A1 knight goes to A1. Two turns in the past here. I mean, these are there's like not a lot going on here, is there? 
Okay, so 94 happens here. The knight on f3 here goes to f4 here, creating an inactive timeline. Uh, and then the bishop checks on e2 and then the game's over okay <laughs> okay interesting what a turn of events i sort of knew i lost after the first travel yeah i mean these you know if you don't know what to do at the end of the game and you're losing then you just sort of stall as long as possible right but i am personally amazed this isn't so much <laughs> it's it's crazy how much of like my defensive 5D chess intuition revolves around having the f having the wing pawns. <laughs> and I guess really more than anything else in this game, the takeaway is that the crab is like so severely weakening in a 5D sense that uh, not only does it only waste time, it actually kind of like cripples you irredeemably. <laughs> um, well, like... I, I would not have imagined that a queen to here, uh, like, off the top of the dome is just straight up crushing without any counterplay, as as it appears that it is. <laughs> uh, wow. Jeez. I mean, it doesn't help that the opponent doesn't have any travels. Um, yeah. He didn't review the first game, it seems. I'm reviewing them in order. Crazy. So, Sonoy, Sonoy submitted this one um, before you submitted yours. Crazy says he won the he won the first game. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that one, too. We'll get to that one. And, you know, maybe maybe the crab will redeem itself. I find it highly unlikely. Um, but, you know, I've lost to some wacky shit before. <laughs> I've lost, there's a Greek, there's a game on my YouTube channel where I lose a game to, I think, Graven, playing A4. It's like Knight F3, A4. Um, but I think H4 is just too much. You need pieces. <laughs> um, I mean, Lo says, I mean, the A4 has been played in the competitive scene before, but probably H4 is too much. I think you're overstating. Y you know what? Sure. Yeah, why not? <laughs> I'll give A4 the credit that it has been played before. I submitted a game for review last year. Last year was three weeks ago. <laughs> Calm down, Andre. This is it. I mean, it was a short and sweet one. <laughs> I, I We learned a lot. I guess it doesn't seem super relevant without the context of a game where the crab does well. <laughs> Otherwise, it just seems like there are a billion reasons why none of this makes any sense to me but you know what that's instructional as well thank you so much for the prime dom oh six months holy shit last week was three years ago that's the one